Uh, we're in Mark chapter 2. Uh, so you have your Bible, you can go ahead and go over to Mark chapter 2. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, there should be these scripture journals somewhere nearby. Uh, I encourage you to grab one and uh, go to Mark chapter 2 there. And uh, that's a great place to follow along as well. A great place to make notes and all that kind of stuff too. Um, and uh, I also, I think we have some of those out in the lobby. If for some reason you don't see one near you today in the seats, you can grab one on your way out. Um, last week we talked about this idea, um, kind of in the uh, beginning of chapter 2, the story about this paralytic and his friends, and, uh, and we had this, uh, and, and the scribes who didn't really care much for Jesus, and today we're going to look at another story, uh, it's similar in some ways, but also different, and uh, causes us to ask some really important questions of ourselves, and, um, and how we look at the world, and so uh, we're going to start in verse 13, if you have your Bible, go there, verse 13. Uh, where it says this. He, Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he, Jesus, reclined at the table uh, in his house, Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard this and then said to them, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Uh, much of uh, this week's story begins much like last week's story. Uh, there's a crowd, uh, and Jesus is teaching them. And again, you're going to see a theme. You're going to see a pattern uh, as we go through the book of Mark that this is something Jesus is bent on doing. From chapter 1, he says, this is my mission. I have come in order to preach and teach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so he's doing that at every place that he goes. He's teaching and he's preaching. And so for much of the first half of this book, you're going to see that happen again and again and again and again because it is why Jesus says he came. And so here he is. He's teaching. People are coming to him. A crowd is coming to him and uh, to listen to him, to experience him, maybe to get the sight of a miraculous healing or something like that as well. But people uh, are hearing about Jesus. And they want to be around Jesus. They're trying to come to him and, uh, and, and experience life with him a little bit. Now, when he is, is walking, apparently, he, he is uh, walking along the way. And as he does, he sees a tax collector's booth. And he looks over and he calls this guy. Guy, Levi to come follow him uh, who's sitting in the tax collector's booth and this is really interesting when you look at how this story is set up because there are those who have chosen to follow Jesus and then those are then 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 there is one in this story but there are others as well uh, who are actually chosen by Jesus to follow him does that make sense and there are many who are coming to him, and then there are some that Jesus is handpicking and choosing of himself. This uh, guy is named Levi. Now, uh, the interesting thing about Levi is when you look at a list of Jesus' disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, or just Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I don't know that there's one in John. I know there are one. There is one in uh, in each of the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a list of his disciples. And Levi is never mentioned in the list of the disciples. And, and so it's like, well, is, is this guy one of the 12? Is he not? Do we know? Um, any of those other kinds of things. Well, um, it's very interesting because Matthew, in his book, tells the same exact story. Uh, he tells the same exact story. Uh, except he doesn't use the name Levi. He uses himself. He, he uses Matthew. To tell, tell, tell the story So he says he's the tax collector that Jesus called um, But there is an interesting fact That's given about Levi um, And like who he is It's that he's the son of Alphaeus Now when you look at a list of Jesus' disciples As a list There is only one who's named as the son of Alphaeus And it's not Matthew It's a guy named James so if you're watching The Chosen, uh, it's little James, not big James. It's little James, right? Um, and uh, he's the son of Alphaeus. And so you wonder, well, was this James? And they just called him Levi because there was already a James, and they didn't want to get him confused, right? Jesus didn't want to go like, hey, James, and two guys come running, you know? So he just named one of them Levi. Um, 
there's lots of different thoughts behind this and who this could be, and, um, and, and ultimately it doesn't really matter. Here's one other argument that I found really compelling when I was trying to figure this out. Who is this Levi guy? Is that most people believe it actually is Matthew, because Matthew writes himself into the story in his own book. But, um, but, there, is this, um, but there is this idea that like Jesus may actually be calling him Levi because he's from the tribe of Levi. That he's calling him Levi to remind him of his identity, his truest identity, because he has exchanged his identity to go and work for the Romans and collect taxes. And he has forgotten who he is. And so Jesus is calling out to him, reminding him, you are Levi, you are one of mine, come and follow me. So I find that argument compelling. Again, there's no, it doesn't say that in the text, so you can't really make any sort of determination on actually who this is. But um, those are all, I think, compelling arguments that were interesting to me. But it's not the point. And, and I want to just say something about this just as a second, because I know that some of you guys are studying Scripture on your own, and I want to just encourage you that as you study Scripture and you find things like this that are interesting to you, as this was interesting to me, uh, then I would encourage you to go down that rabbit trail. As long as you want to go down that rabbit trail, you will have fun going down that rabbit trail. It will be enjoyable for you to go down that rabbit trail, and you will learn something, and you will be like, hey, this is pretty cool, right? Even if you don't come up with a definite answer. But don't let the rabbit trail be everything that your Bible is all about. Take a look at the story and see what the story is really about. Because it's not about L Levi or who Levi is. It's, it's, it's about how um, the, the, the type of person Levi was and that he was not one expected to be called. See, the reality is, is what Jesus is doing, and I think the point is that Jesus is trying to show us his intent desire on, on trying to share this message and send a message to the world that I am going to pick people that you do not expect me to pick. I'm going to invite people to the table that you would not invite to the table. I'm going to invite the people that no one wants around. See, this guy had the label of tax collector, which meant that he was not welcome amongst his Jewish com contemporaries or counterparts, um, uh, because everyone believed that if he was a tax collector, his motives were clear, even though his motives aren't clear. But, but just because he had the title of tax collector, they placed that label on him and said, well, we know what your motives are. Your motives are to line your pockets and seek protection from the Romans. But that might not have been his motives, right? I mean, his motives might not have been that at all. In fact, his motives might have been the fact that he just, he wanted to be and, and, and study under a rabbi, but was told he wasn't good enough. And so he just kind of rejected his Jewish heritage and religion and gave himself to do whatever he could do to make a good income. It might be that, that ultimately he was actually a really good dude and he didn't want to see his Jewish counterparts taken advantage of. And so he... He decided to do this job so that he could ensure that at least when they were working with him, he wasn't going to exploit them or take advantage of them or take more money from them than he should or was supposed to. Again, we don't know his motive. We don't know any of these things. Uh, but, but it's interesting that just because he had a label put on him, people didn't want to be around him. And people did not expect people like Jesus to want to be around him. But Jesus invites him. And I think it's a, it's a really important thing for us to see and for us to understand that, um, that, that we too, we too should be careful to cast people out of our circle. We, we should be very careful to set boundaries for people and keep people um, on, on the outskirts where, where they are not... Uh, uh, able to enter in or be a part of whatever we have going on. We should be very careful to put labels on people and reject them due to our cultural formation, due to our upbringing, our family of origin, political or religious ideologies, due to, uh, due to our race. We need to be careful not to label people and reject them. Because Jesus doesn't label people and reject them. But he invites them. He invites them. And we're going to see 
uh, why he does this in just a little bit. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. It says, And he reclined at the table. So again, that's Jesus. He reclined at the table in his house. That's Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw what he, that he was eating with sinners, tax collectors, asked his disciples, Why is he doing this? Why does he do this? Why does he go to people's place, houses and eat with tax collectors and sinners like this? This is, this is, not, this is not okay. No, we, can't, we can't have this. Right? Jesus heard this, and he said to them, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. And I haven't come to call the righteous, but the sinner. And so um, Jesus um, is sitting at this banquet. It says he's reclining. Now, here's what I find interesting and fascinating about this. It seems like he's having a good time. It seems like Jesus is having a good time. Uh, I think the meal is over, and now he's just hanging out, right? Right? You guys do this with your friends, right? You invite them over for a meal, and then you just kind of chat. And t- you hang out, and you maybe play board games or whatever you do, right? I don't know what, what kind of people you are. If you're board game people, great. Come over. We'll play. Uh, if, if, if you you know you like sports, come over. That's fine, right? If you like, if you like watching the History Channel, go to somebody else's house, all right? Um, but, um, but, the, but the reality is, is like, man, like, there's, a, uh, there's this aspect of, like, he, he's just reclining, hanging out with his friends. Right? His fin- friends are reclining and hanging out with him. It, this, is, this is Jesus enjoying himself with, with other people. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? Put yourself in the position of the host for just a second, right? Do you invite people to your house that you don't like? Let me answer that for you. No, you don't, okay? You don't because you don't, you don't like them, right? You don't want them around. Uh, do, you, do you say yes to going to people's houses that you don't like? Very rarely, right? And if you do, you're being very polite and you're trying to find a time to leave as soon as possible, right? Like you're just, you're like, this is, this is the way that it works, right? You're not going to, ch- you're not going to like hang out, recline at the table, enjoy the company, right? This is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is, is not just being polite because he was invited into this guy's home to have a, a party with these tax collectors. And Jesus enjoys being with these tax collectors and sinners. Do you see this? And these tax collectors and sinners enjoy being with him. That's a really, really beautiful thing about Jesus. And it would seem as if Jesus is, is uh, you know, just having, having a good old time, right? And we know that the spirit of God was there because Jesus was there. But there were probably also other spirits there, if you know what I'm saying, you know? Because that's, you know, what they do at parties. And, um, and so this was, you know, this was a party. And so I just want to, I want to take a side note here uh, just for a second uh, to kind of uh, maybe uh, offer a, a word of advice, maybe, maybe also encouragement. Because um, I'm not trying to make light of the fact that Jesus would hang out with people who would be indulging and drinking and, um, and things like that. Uh, I know not everyone has had a healthy experience with alcohol, and, um, and so I'm not even saying that we should engage in alcohol. I'm just saying I don't think that Jesus has a problem with it. And, um, and he was in a situation where uh, he was with companions who were seeking after him, and he was with new people who were seeking to know him better and know him more, and to be in a situation like that and that stuff be happening, he was totally okay with it. And so here's my encouragement to you is that if you're going to engage in that sort of, like you, you want to you have a drink, I don't think Jesus has a problem with that. Here's how I think that you can do that in a way that on, honestly could honor him and, and actually be uh, helpful um, and not hurtful um, is if you were to do that amongst a group of people who are seeking after him or who are following him. If you're, if you're engaging with people who are actually seeking after Jesus and are trying to follow him, and you guys have a drink together, I think that's a pretty safe place to have a drink. If you jump in to have a drink with someone who has no desire to be with Jesus or know Jesus or, or have any relationship with Jesus at all, um, that, that could be more dangerous than maybe you want to enter into. And it may not be the healthiest place for you to actually be a witness for Christ. And so I hear a lot of people say, like, oh, man, I just go hang out with my buddies at the bar, and I'm trying to, you know, you just, you know let them know that all Christians aren't, you know, square. 
And it's like, I, I get that, but like, there's a healthy way to do that. And, and if you're not actually trying to lead them to Jesus, and you're just like hanging out with them, uh, and there's more of them than there are people like you, my guess is their influence is going to have more of an impact on you than your influence is going to have on them. Because the Bible says that. But if you are in a group of people who are all seeking after Jesus together and trying to follow him together, and there's maybe one or two people there who aren't uh, as excited or interested in Jesus, they would probably be more influenced by that group than them having an influence over the group. So just, when you engage in those kinds of things, I just want to encourage you, like, that's not a terrible way to go about loving your, your circle of influence or trying to reach them for Christ. It's not a terrible way, but it needs to be done with a lot of, uh, like, intentionality and care. And so one way you could do this is if your friend after work says, hey, you want to go grab drinks? And you're like, well, I don't know if he's a Christian or I don't know if they're a Christian. I don't even know if they're interested in Jesus. You could say, yeah, I'd love to go grab a drink with you. Can I talk to you about Jesus? <laughs> and they may go, no, no, you cannot. <laughs> and that's a, great, that's a great thing to know, right? That's a great thing to know because then you can say, all right, well, then I'm just going to find other ways to spend time and hang out with that dude or that lady. Maybe you just say, hey, you would like to go to drinks after, after work, you know, maybe Thursday, and I'd love to share with you what God's doing in my life. And they go, well, you know, I, I'm not really super interested in that. Okay, no, no pressure, just, if you ever do, like I'm here, I'd love to do that. So uh, there, there are unthreatening ways to, to go about doing that and to be a witness and to be an example and to love uh, people and and encourage people in that direction and meet them where they're comfortable right meet them in a place where they're comfortable anyway all right let's wrap this thing up okay because now it's like big side notes um last week we talked about the pharisees and how they had put jesus in a box these pharisees have done the same thing right the 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 scribes and pharisees have put jesus in a box to say tax collectors don't get in these types of people don't get in tax collectors and sinners don't fit inside of the box. God doesn't like these kinds of people, so we shouldn't either. That's the idea, right? I mean, it is, uh, it's a pretty, pretty gross box. Um, and they've, they've put Jesus in this place, and, and he overhears their question, and he doesn't even care that the question isn't directed to him, that, that's directed to his disciples. He's going to go ahead and answer. He says, but I have come because it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick, and I've come to call. And that, that, that's an important word, call. I've come to call not the righteous, but the sinner. So let's talk about this for just a second. If Jesus has come for the sick and the sinner. Who should we hope that we are? The sick and the sinner. And what I think oftentimes can happen is if we aren't careful, we, we stop asking or we stop relating to ourselves in a methodology or in a way where we see ourselves as sick in need of a savior, in need of a great physician. We can, we can become so religious and we can become so, uh, like, so culturally Christian that we stop seeing ourselves as in need of the grace that Jesus puts on offer. And we always need the grace that Jesus puts on offer. We always need it because we are the sick. And we should always want to be the sick because not only should we see ourselves as sick, but it's those who... Um, who, who are sick, we, we should desire and embrace that sickness because that's who Jesus has come for. If we try and like, like, like hide behind some sort of self-righteousness, Jesus doesn't come for those people. Who does he come for? He comes for the sick and the sinner. So let us not be like ashamed of that. Let us embrace that. And say, this is how I'm going to meet Jesus. This is how I'm going to know him. Because this is who he has come to be with. And who he has come to call. Which brings me to a second thing that I think is really important. Is that Jesus is making a call. 
He is calling out. He is inviting people to follow him and to be a part of his life and to be a part of his ministry and to be a part of his kingdom. And he doesn't call people that we would expect or that anyone else would expect. He calls the people that no one expects. If you think of your... So here's the fascinating thing. If you think of yourself as unworthy to be called by God, you're the perfect person to be called by God. Do you realize this? You're like, oh, I could never... Well, you're the one he's going to want to call. He doesn't want to call guys like me who want to stand up on a stage and preach all the time. Can I just be honest? Like, he wants to call the guy in the seats who's like, I never want to talk in church. Ever. Like, don't get me anywhere near my, I don't, he, that's the person he wants to use. That's the story he wants to redeem. Because that person doesn't feel like they've earned it. That person doesn't feel like they deserve it. That person knows that they are sick and in need of a savior. And that's exactly what qualifies them to be called and invited into the presence of God. And have a relationship with the God of the universe. It's those who aren't entitled. It's those who aren't educated. It's those who don't know what to look for. And honestly, it's those who don't deserve to be there. And when we realize that, God calls us anyway. That's a really meaningful and powerful call. It's an invitation to say, come, follow me. And that invitation says to someone who doesn't feel worthy that like, they're wanted who doesn't feel wanted, like, he, he wants to be around me. That's what an invitation means. When, when, when an invitation is extended, it just, it just means you're wanted. And you're not wanted because you're good enough to be wanted. You're wanted because he loves you, even though you're not good enough to be wanted. You're wanted because he wants to save you. You're wanted because he wants to heal you. You're wanted because he wants to be with you and he wants to be friends with you and have a relationship with you. When you get to like this kind of understanding and you realize that the invitation to follow Jesus is this kind of call, man, is it a special invitation. It's a beautiful invitation. Think about anyone that you admire for just a second, right? Think about anyone you admire. If they were to extend, you, uh, extend to you an invitation, how would you feel? Would you be there? Wouldn't you do everything you could do to be there in that moment? So I have a, I have a friend who often uh, gives me uh, or, or invites me to go to hockey games with him, go to Canes games with him, um, and... Uh, I, I may have talked about this friend in the past, uh, and I don't know, because all my sermons are the same. They just run together. Uh, I, pre I preach the same thing every week. You guys, if you guys haven't figured it out yet. Um, so, you know, go to another church next week. Um, anyway, uh, but he, he'll invite me to these games, and he's been super kind and super nice to me, and, um, and he, he extends the invite. When he extends the invite, I always say yes, like as fast as possible. I'm like, yep. Absolutely, I, yep, I'm going to do it. And, uh, and, and sometimes he'll just offer me his tickets. He'll just say, hey, do you, you, you want to take my seats tonight? I'm not going. Uh, you know, take somebody with you. And, uh, and, I, and I always will say yes. And I've even stopped trying to pay him. Like, I've, I used to, like, ask him, like, hey, can I give you anything? No, he will never accept payment for these things. Never let me pay him. And, man, these seats are special. Can I just be honest? I mean, they are super special seats. They're like 20 rows up, center ice. Uh, it's the mo there is not a more expensive seat in PNC Arena. I'm telling you that right now. There is not. I, I've already looked it up. There's not a more expensive seat <laughs> in PNC. I mean, these are, these are incredible seats to watch a game. And, I'm, and, and, um, and, and I realized something not too long ago um, when I was going is that I have done nothing to earn these seats. I've done no, I did zero hard work. I saved up zero dollars to, to, to buy these seats. I didn't wait out in the cold to try and scalp them in order that I could get access. I, he, just, he just gives them to me. 
He just hands them over. And I get to sit in a place that, quite honestly, is too good for me. I get to sit in seats that I can't afford and that I don't belong with the people who can't afford them. Like, I did nothing to earn these seats. All I did was become friends with a guy who has the best seats in the house and who oftentimes offers as, as his friendship to me this gracious generosity that I get to be the beneficiary of. None of us, none of us deserve a seat with Jesus at his table. And yet he has graciously offered them to us. Said, come, follow me, sit with me, sit next to me. Let's recline at the table and enjoy one another's company. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And if we lose sight of that, we lose sight of the fact that we are the sick, that we are the depraved, that we are the undeserving, the uneducated, the ones who don't belong at the table. We become self-righteous. If we miss and we forget that we don't deserve to sit anywhere near Jesus, but he offers it to us anyway. He just gives us a seat. And he lets us enjoy time at the table with him. And he enjoys time at the table with us. Man, don't we want to be sick? Here's the, here's the question that I think we all have to begin to ask ourselves is have we, have we begun to think about ourselves as if we are too good? Have we begun to think that we are too well? That we don't need a doctor? Are we too self-confident in our own way of life or in our own religious behavior? Have we become self-righteous? Are we somehow more qualified than others? Are we somehow more deserving? We have to always ask ourselves this question. We always have to ask ourselves this question. As I was asking myself this question this past week, a, a, a thought came to mind that, uh, of, of how I could tell. How might I be able to tell if I actually was self-righteous? If I actually was um, thought of myself as better or more qualified or more deserving than others to sit at the table with Jesus? And I get this opportunity way more than you guys, so this may not land, it may not resonate, but I hope that it does. And, um, and, and what I would say is, um, for me... I will sit down and I'll have a conversation with someone about following Jesus, about becoming a Christian. I'll have a conversation with them about what it means to follow Jesus, about repentance and about baptism. And, and we'll talk about uh, how one would, would follow and become a Christian and, and choose to follow Jesus with their life. And, uh, and there are times that I walk away from the table very cynical and very skeptical. Even though that, that person has said, oh yeah, that's what I want. I want a new life. I want to follow him. I want to be with him. I want to live differently. There are times where I walk away cynical and skeptical, thinking, eh, nah, it's not going to work for them. I mean, that's, if I'm just being honest, like that's pretty dark. But there's truth in that. I think sometimes we can become very skeptical and very cynical of other people's conversion, other people's uh, discipleship, other people's life of repentance. We can become very skeptical of their walk with God because it doesn't look like ours, because it doesn't seem like ours, or they're not hungry for the same stuff that we're hungry for. And if we do that, I think maybe we might be more pharisaical than we would like to admit. We might have lost view of our own depravity and our own sickness. May have lost view of the fact that we are the ones in need of Jesus' gracious generosity in order to take a seat at the table. 
we are not good enough and we did not deserve it or earn it. And so I just say, like, maybe we need to ask ourselves, have we become these kinds of people? Trying to be good Christians, trying to go to church, trying to do all the right stuff. Have we become more confident in ourselves than we should be? More confident in our religious practice than we should be? I've come to uh, remember this saying, and, I, and I, I, hope, I hope this will help you think about it. This is the way I think about it, and I, I choose to think about it. It said, on my worst day, I will never be good enough to sit where Jesus invites his friends to sit. On my best day, on my best day, I will never be good enough to sit where Jesus invites his friends to sit. But on my worst day, I will never be bad enough for him not to reach out and extend the invitation. On my best day, I don't deserve a chance or a seat at the table. And on my worst day, he'll still extend the invitation to come and be with him anyway. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, is that we have done nothing to deserve the invitation, but he gives it to us anyway, because he loves us, and because we are the sick sinners that he came to save so praise be to God that we have, we have a good and great physician who has come to be with us in this way. Amen? I want to just talk a little bit about next steps um, for you because I think there's a couple that I can think of. The first one is maybe you have never, uh, you've never given yourself over to following Jesus. You just, um, maybe you've always been too self-righteous without religion to think you need him. Maybe you just don't think you are, you belong because you messed up. You, I want you to know you're the exact person that Jesus extends an invite to and is saying, come, follow me. He, you are the one that he is saying, I want you to come to the altar and I want you to, to trust me and follow me with your life. And so if you've never done that, this is a great place to do that. It's a great opportunity to do that. I would welcome uh, the opportunity to speak with you and talk to you, whether that's during this last kind of song that we're going to sing or, uh, or even if that's after church sometime today. Like we could be here for hours talking about Jesus, and that's not going to hurt my feelings at all because the bills don't play till tomorrow. Uh, I'm, ki- I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I, but I'm, but I'm just saying that like the, I, it doesn't. Whenever you need to talk, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to accept the invitation, come. I want to have that conversation. I want to help you understand how much God loves you, and how much He has invited you to be with Him. But here's the other thing. And this is going to sound maybe judgmental, and it's going to sound maybe a little bit harsh, but I promise you it's not. Um, If anything, it's it's my own heart that's broken over this matter because I I take some responsibility in this. As a leader in the church, I believe it's it's partly my fault that this is the way that that we choose to live and walk uh, is because we haven't done a good enough job of discipling you. We haven't done a good enough job of, of, of talking to you about how to handle certain situations. And I, but, but I gotta be honest with you, I've seen it in this church, I've seen it in almost every church I've ever worked in or been a part of or led, is that Christians are so emotionally unhealthy. People who are Christians, call themselves Christians, especially in the South, are so emotionally unhealthy because we get to this idea of where like, oh, we're all supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ, so we can't tell people how we feel, and we can't tell people what we think. Especially if we think something negative about them. Can I just be honest with you? Like, that's not healthy. Because what you're going to do, if that's how you stand, if you stand, you're going you're gonna to walk through this you're going to walk through Christian community with this idea of, well, just bless their heart. I'm going to go somewhere else. 
And it's really sad. It's really sad that we can't sit across the table from other Christian brothers and sisters and say, hey, you hurt me. And this is how you hurt me. And it's really, it's really sad. We can't sit across the table from other Christian brothers and sisters and say, hey, I think you did this, and when you did it, you sinned. And you need to repent. And you need to ask for forgiveness. I think it's really, really passive aggressive and unhealthy to walk through life and think like this is how Christians act no Christians are not supposed to be codependent and Christians are not supposed to be passive aggressive we're supposed to love one another and the best way to love one another can I just be honest, is to speak the truth in love when you choose not to speak the truth you lie and you know who the father of lies is in John 8? is the enemy. He loves it when you lie. He loves it when you won't tell the truth to another brother or sister. Because then you just think that lying works. And the other thing is your brother and sister, if they take that lie as truth because they can't see that it's not, they begin to live their life based on a lie. That is the most unloving thing you can do to a Christian brother or sister. It is not loving. It is not kind. And it is not healthy. We are sick and need of a great physician to come and help us with these things. And so I want to invite you to take a next step in that. And so I'm going to put a QR code up on the screen. This is... Uh, a QR code that you can scan. It'll take you to an assessment called an Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Assessment. Um, you can scan that, and you can take this assessment, um, and it will give you a, a series of questions. And at the end of it, you'll get a score, and your score will tell you how emotionally healthy you are. Um, if you're anything like me, you're going to be surprised at how unhealthy you are. <laughs> Because the reality is if you're honest and you do this honestly and you fill this out honestly and you, you go through this process honestly, you'll learn some things about yourself that, that you need Jesus to come and restore and heal and make new so that you can be a better disciple of Christ. And so I encourage you to go and do that this week. Um, take that assessment and, and, and learn and grow and become a stronger and better disciple of Jesus uh, by, by learning those things and knowing those things. Um, I, I want to, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on David for just a second to give you a, just an example of how this works. Um, I know, he, he loves it when I brag on him. He's so arrogant. He's actually the most humble person, uh, one of the most humble people I've ever met. Um, and, um, but not too long ago, we were sitting in a staff gathering with, with some volunteers as well. We were, we were planning and strategizing and thinking through some things as a, as a team. We were sitting around a table, and uh, this idea of this song came up. Uh, that like we've played here at church before and I I'm not a fan and I, but I made it very vocally clear how much of a fan not a fan I was in this meeting and I'm, I'm I went all out sarcastic you know passive aggressive I was like oh this song is terrible you know like I was just like this is the worst song ever I hate it uh and I and I went into this like I went into this like diatribe of like oh I would rather die than listen to, you know like all that stuff and David um who also is one of the most emotionally health people I've ever been around stopped the meeting in its tracks and he said, you know, Derek, he said, I, I, I want to say something. And he goes, I don't care if anybody here doesn't like this. He said, if we love each other, we can't be passive aggressive and we can't use sarcasm when we have a disagreement. 
We can't try and let those things shut everyone else down and, and shut down our willingness to listen to other people's opinions. And, and he said, um, that's not how people who love each other and who are trying to build unity together do things. And I'm so grateful for that. Right? I mean, he could have easily just gone, yep, just another bad leader in the church. Just another immature, young, I'm going to speak my mind at all times leader. And he could have just walked out of the meeting and thought, like, I don't, you know, being frustrated. But instead, he decided to be honest. And he did it in a loving way. And he corrected and rebuked me. And in that moment, he became my pastor. And so, this is the kind of thing that we need. We need more conversations like that. We need to put ourselves in situations where those kinds of things can happen and take place. So that we can be the people God wants us to be. Amen? Let's pray. God, I, um, I just, I thank you that we get a chance to be here and be a part of this community and be a part of this church. And God, I just pray that we'll give ourselves over to you. God, that we will never become so self-righteous or self-confident in our own opinions or our own feelings or our own thoughts to think as if we have it figured out and that we got it right and everyone else has it wrong. I pray that we will give ourselves over to this reminder each day that each day we are not good enough to be invited and yet you've invited us. And that's a means and a reason to worship and sing and give glory and praise and speak of your goodness because you are the, you are the best thing that's ever happened to us. We deserve the labels. We deserve to be outcasts. We deserve to be thrown outside of of what is acceptable and yet you invite us in and you want to use us and you want to change us and you want to transform us and you want to send us out to make impact in the lives of others in the world and so God may we accept this invitation may we accept the invitation to be with you and follow you may we accept the invitation and, and may, may us accepting this invitation May it bring more people into contact with you. May it bring more of our friends and our circle of influence into contact with you that you can change and transform them as well. God, we love you. We praise you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.